to let the amnesia of this very present crisis of the white lash forget us to allow us to forget um, what has come before and what we were living through before and what generations before us were fighting against. I think there's no important time than the present to look toward creating new possibilities in our present moment and to aim to intervene in the future because that's what's happening with the white lashes. They are trying to create also a new world that looks perhaps much or even worse than the old one, but that we, are, we too need to ground ourselves in building a new future. So this talk is called 21st Century Black Liberation. And if there could be a subtitle, it would be expanding the terrain of our emancipatory struggle. And I want to open what I think will be the main anchor of the rest of this talk by reading part of a statement by the Kombahi River Collective. This may be familiar to you, I hope so. But I think it's very important, and I think you'll see why as I speak about really the next, the next issues. If black women were free, it would mean that everyone else would have to be free, since our freedom would necessitate the destruction of all the systems of oppression. There's a reason that this statement is familiar, if, even if it's not known perhaps by heart. Um, it's an excerpt of a collaboratively, collaboratively written piece called A Black Feminist Statement, published in 1979 by a collective of black lesbian uh, feminists, including Barbara Smith, Audre Lorde. They were part of a broader collective that fought police brutality, fought police violence, and you know mod modern segregation. But they also insisted that our struggle had to be so much more than that insisted that our struggle take on gendered oppression, take on homophobia, and um, really broaden what it means to fight for freedom. There's a reason that this statement is still so widely used after 40 years after its initial publication, because it captures, I think, a world of complex and overlapping oppressions, and also a world of liberatory possibilities. So really, I think we'll see, we'll begin to see how I'm using this to ground what it means for us to look at state-sanctioned violence in Canada for 400 years and what it means to try to address that and to break with that. I believe that this statement speaks to the importance of developing a political consciousness, a critical consciousness of the world around it. It urges us to look to the material conditions faced by black people, specifically black women, specifically poor black women in North America and worldwide to better comprehend the world that we're facing, the world that we're trying to transform and to allow us to map a broader vision of transformation than certain more narrow versions of black power movements had before. Not just for black women's liberation, but for black liberation and for human liberation more broadly. In the 1980s, Audre Lorde wrote something that remains today as true as ever. We are black people living in a time when the consciousness of our intended slaughter is all around us. And I think she's using that in a twofold way, talking as well to the importance of political consciousness of what so many you know, activists and community, um, community building black peoples have been doing before, just passing on that consciousness so we're better able to take on the systems that are continuing to really rob us of freedom. It's important to understand anti-black racism as not uniquely American, and not even as Canada too, but as part of a global phenomenon, something that has been global long past the abolition of the slave trade, which of course was a global project. Worldwide, black people are mobilizing against a lot at this moment, against the pending deportation of the Windrush generation in the United Kingdom, against not only police violence in North America, but the 60,000 Haitians to be expelled from this continent. There are thousands of Nigerian women still held in Italian prisons for prostitution-related offenses. And of course, I think all of us are deeply saddened and horrified by our um, by the Africans that are now dying continually in the, Medi in the Mediterranean Sea, trying to reach Europe, which is being, of course, defended, defended by Frontex. Two years before the eruption of the Black Lives Matter movement, 50 to 60,000 black women took to the streets in Brazil to protest the state-sanctioned violence against black women, as well as ongoing police impunity. So despite its global realities, Canadians are trained to identify anti-black racism as something that occurs in another place, the United States, or another time, the past. Um, and I mean that very literally in terms of trained. I mean universities very much like this one. I mean public schooling. I mean education more broadly. I mean the media that we continue to pass on this message so well and so frequently that the, exist the conditions of black people in this country so frequently remain erased. The present situation that is here and now, as well as the past, is continually displaced and disavowed. 
And that's despite the amazing work that's happening even here on this campus. I'm so proud to have been, uh, to have the Black Liberation Collective present here. I think that that's an extremely important initiative. Um, but what's happening in these schools and in these universities is not accidental. It needs to be understood as a concerted and ongoing effort to erase black experiences from the public realm. And it's an absolute necessity that this lack of awareness and consciousness in the broader public needs to be interrupted. And I think many of us here are committed to that interruption. A lack of knowledge can be, um, is often described as, in, as a, a kind of innocence, right? I think that a lack of knowledge, the lack of knowledge that we're looking to today though is one that is willful. And in the context of structural harm, that kind of innocence means very little. So James Baldwin in The Fire Next Time spoke to this very well. And he said, they have destroyed and are destroying hundreds and thousands of lives and do not know it and do not want to know it. It is not permissible that the authors of devastation should also be innocent. It is the innocence which constitutes the crime. I think that remains as relevant as it does today, particularly in a context in which literally every generation of activists is trying, of black activists, of black community members, of families, is trying to insert a history that we know is there, that has always been there, and coming up against the same erasure, being promised a study, as if that will finally prove something that we have been insisting is there for hundreds of years. I spoke a few minutes ago about how despite the intensified and perhaps more vocal racism that we're seeing today, that we don't respond only with condemnation to the white lash, to the audible expressions of racial hatred, transphobic hatred more broadly, but that we fight it in all of its embodiments, that we don't allow ourselves to be distracted from the broader issues. Now, it's important for us to understand that racism has been structured into Canadian society since before Confederation. And while perhaps visible, visibly and visibly anew, racism itself is part of how this country has always functioned. Now, I'm not going to list a long list of statistics proving racism to you, but I want to ground us in just some, I think, some basic structural facts that are very important to understanding the conditions that we find ourselves in today. We can see, we know that in Canadian prisons, black communities face a, a rate of incarceration that is three times higher than those of, of white prisoners. You see the rates of police stops, which I don't need to reiterate here in every city that it's been studied. We see even more, uh, I think, horrifyingly, the rates of police killings and the disproportionate way that black communities continue to be killed um, at the hands of the police. If we think of Abdi and Abdi, Andrew Goku, Bonnie Jean-Pierre, Pierre Coriolan, those are only a few recent names. Nicholas Gibbs, actually, who was just, whose family was just out yesterday in Montreal, um, where several families of people uh, killed by the police, an organization that I was part of for a long time, were out protesting ongoing police impunity and racism in that country. We also know that in immigration, because so many of us black people in Canada are not actually born here, or have family members that were not born here, that something as simple as a traffic stop or a marijuana arrest does not end in the criminal justice system, but extends deeply into the immigration system, where immigration detention is one of the primary sources of violence against many of our lives. In, Can in 2016 to 2017, over 6,000 migrants were detained, 439 for longer than three months, and including 162 minors, which is something that we often look at as a very American phenomenon, this idea of incarcerating children, right? This is to say that it is not just Trump, that this country's history of settler colonialism and slavery are living today across all the institutions that are public institutions that are, that, that are funded by taxpayer <coughs> money that are really Canadian institutions. And it's essential that we remember this fact when we face the, riding tide, the rising tide of white nationalism and white supremacy today. Lest we become too involved in the crisis of the present, a historical context really allows us to see more fully what we're up against. With policing black lives, it was important for me to show how ways of viewing and treating blackness that were created under the global transatlantic slave trade and through 200 years of slavery in Canada were not abolished when Britain's colonies abolished the slave trade in 1834. Instead, widely held beliefs surrounding blackness that were forged under slavery, that black people are pathological, more animal than human, less sentient, less able to feel pain, possessing a dangerous sexuality and criminal, have carried forward into the present day. 